some fun projects you can do in the winter coming up next. I'm Alan Smith, welcome to the show. Well, it's chilly outside, but we're gonna hang out in here where it's warm. I love my little workroom during the winter. It's a great place to pass those cold, cold days. But first, if you know me, you know I love to raise chickens. We'll visit with a poultry specialist who gives us a few good reasons to raise these beautiful birds. I'll also show you how to make this simple bowl made of ice and herbs, plus talk about fall and winter vegetables. And don't forget, I'll answer a viewer question and show you how to make this mouth-watering buttermilk pecan pie. So as you can see, we have a lot to cover in today's show, but we have to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're gonna talk chickens. There are several reasons why I enjoy raising chickens. While it's a lot of fun and a great hobby, there are also some practical reasons why you might wanna keep a few. Poultry specialist Keith Bramwell tells us more about the rewards of raising chickens. Let's just take, uh, do, do a little math here. Let, let's say someone wanted just to have a small flock. Let's say 25 birds, mm -hmm. a good dual purpose bird. Maybe it's a Wyandotte, maybe it's a Rhode Island Red, you know, maybe a Jersey Black Giant, something like that. With 25 birds, what sort of egg production could you, could you look for? We typically look at in some of those types of birds as a, as a life of flock about you know, 65% production overall, which in a flock of 25 birds in a given year might give you six or 700 eggs. Wow, so when you say 65% production, that would be if a hen lays an egg, typically one a day, 65% of the days in the year she would produce an egg. Correct. With that flock of 25, what would you calculate to be the amount of feed you would have to provide them, say, per week? On a weekly basis, a good average is about a 50 pound bag of feed per week for a flock of 25 birds. Um, more so later on as they get a little bit older and when they're younger, obviously they don't need as much. Now, if you had them free ranging on pasture, there are their pastured birds, meaning they could get grass and that sort of thing, that would probably come down Oh, some. sure, sure, much less. And actually, some people actually will not even give them free choice of feed if they're gonna let them be out on the pasture. They will feed them a little bit in the morning and then let them go out and forage and range for the rest of their feed. Obviously, if you have them confined, you've got to provide feed for them pretty much at all times, but uh, that, that depends on the situation and how you're raising your birds. Well, and you know, chickens love table scraps. Absolutely, and they're good for them too. You know, <laughs> give, them, give them the leftovers and, they, and it's good for them, gives them a variety in their diet. The interest in chickens has, has come up just in the past five years. What are some of the reasons that you think it's great to have chickens around? There's a lot of reasons you could have chickens. One, if you want to produce your own eggs, if you want to produce your own meat. Um, you know, you have a garden, they produce a little bit of you know their, their manure, give you some fertilizer you can put in your garden and, and it's a natural there again, it's a natural fertilizer rather than going and buying fertilizer. Well, you know, we use our chicken tractor that I made on a trailer for that very purpose. We, we fertilize the pastures. Uh, by really rolling it around and the droppings are, are a source of organic fertilizer. It works great. Yeah, and even if you're not moving a pen around, you gotta clean it out sometime. You get it and clean it out and spread it out in your garden and it will grow fantastically with a little bit of chicken, <laughs> chicken litter as a fertilizer. Never underestimate the power of chicken litter. That's right, that's right. It's, it's good stuff and it's natural. It's a natural uh, you know, product that we have that we can make use of. You know, I have to say one of the great benefits is if you can get children involved in raising raising chickens, allowing them to become involved in in the process of nature of raising something right. can really instill a, a lot of good values yeah. in a child. Yeah. If they learn responsibility, getting up in the morning, and feeding them, and caring for them, and picking up the eggs, and there's a lot of good good traits. You know, Keith, I raised chickens when I was a kid, and just and just loved it. You had them as well, didn't you? I had all kinds of chickens. I had big ones, little ones, white ones, black ones, all colors, all varieties. I showed them at fairs, uh, bred them, sold them to people, gave them away to people. Um, I had a lot of chickens, and it was a tremendous, uh, it's a tremendous memory in my life of raising the birds when I was a kid. After the break, we'll make this herb ice bowl and talk about fall and winter vegetables. So stay with us. 
Now here's a creative way to keep dips or salads nice and cool. All you have to do is make an herb ice bowl. It's really easy to make. Take two stainless steel bowls. One should fit inside the other with about three quarters of an inch space between the two edges. You'll find that adding a little water to the larger bowl first, then placing the smaller bowl inside will help the small bowl float a little higher, which makes it easier to tape the sides together. Then all you have to do is go gather some of your favorite herbs, clip them, and take the cuttings and stuff them between the two bowls. You can use things like lavender, mint, lemon thyme, lemon balm, and even mosquito plant. These are just a few that are very aromatic and work really well. Next, pour the water between the bowls until it reaches the rim and place it in the freezer overnight. When you're ready to use your ice bowl, set it out for about 10 minutes at room temperature. Remove the tape from the sides and remove the ice bowl. This bowl is perfect for holding dips or salads at any function. Give it a try. Now, just because it's cold outside doesn't mean you still can't enjoy delicious vegetables from the garden. My friend Lois Chaplin recently visited the farm where she tells us about several fabulous fall and winter vegetables. You know, one of the great things about gardening in a mild climate where the ground doesn't freeze is you can plant a fall garden and here it is January and I'm outside harvesting this hardy Savoy cabbage and I've got collards over here and it won't be long before I'm ready to plant again. I can put peas in the ground, I can plant cabbages again, collards, kale, cauliflower, mustard, turnips, radishes, all kinds of cool weather greens, and I can add parsley to that, and rosemary, and arugula, and lettuce, and just have a full-blown garden beginning in February and March. Now, I just went around the garden and pulled these collards, but they are so hardy that I could have just pulled the leaves off and left the tips to grow some more through the winter, especially under a row cover or something that keeps them warm. So if you've never had a fall garden, I would encourage you to plant one. Even if you live in the north, you can put these cold hardy crops in a greenhouse or in a cold frame or under a row cover, anything that helps to uh, keep them warm and they'll do well until the ground gets really hard frozen. Now we need to take another quick break, but when we return, we'll head to Caleb's house and see what he has going on in the garden. Plus we'll answer a viewer question, so don't go anywhere. Over the past few months, I've been helping my web designer, Caleb Rash, with his gardening projects. Let's go and see what he's accomplished and what he's working on now. We've gotten a lot done with the garden. It's looking really good, Caleb. I think the last touch here is to get these containers done before it gets too cold. Right. What I want you to do is, uh, are there bulbs, or are they over there? Yeah. So um, we got is a hundred of these cardinal tulips, and uh, the idea here is to is to uh, really pack them in the containers. We've got um, three containers here, and we've got the red cabbage in the smallest one, and then we've got these two. And what I'd like to see you do is put um, about 75 bulbs in this big one, and about 25 bulbs in that one. And what I'm what I'm doing is I'm trying to make an insulating ring around here because it's going to get cold and these pots can freeze to a certain amount, but um, you don't want them to freeze solid and this, the soil will make a nice insulator. And then what we need to do is just place these bulbs in here side by side and, and then we'll layer them. We'll actually put one layer of tulips in and then we'll put in uh, some soil on top of them and then put another layer of tulips on top of that. Then we'll cover it all up and then we're gonna overplant it with those pansies and then everything that we've done out in the garden over the last, you know, throughout the fall, uh, when it blooms in the spring, it'll all work together with what we got planted up here on the, on the porch. So uh, hopefully that's gonna work for you and Caitlin. Now, are there any precautions that we need to take? Uh, any differences between planting bulbs in the yard and planting them in containers that I need to worry about? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, you know, typically we have saucers under the containers with for water. We're gonna water these in and then leave them alone. They should be okay. fine. But you don't want the you don't want the saucer with water in it because it'll freeze and it's going to break your container. So you don't want to do that. The other, if it gets really really cold, y'all may want to wrap bubble wrap around these because we're going to leave them sitting out on the front porch because right. they're going to have pansies in them. But you may want to insulate them. But you know we're in zone seven. Sometimes it can get really that cold, but that wouldn't last for very long. So you just need to be prepared for that. Okay, you about got yours lined out? Just about. Okay, 
because what I'm going to do is get I'm getting ready to cover up my first layer and don't be afraid to stack them because the tulip will find its way up the bloom it'll find its way up the, the flower stalk will find its way up through the soil and even through this bed of pansies we're going to put on top and the, the other thing too um, you're going to need to feed the pansies over the over the course of the winter they like to be fed um, you need to, just because it's winter, it doesn't mean they don't need some nutrient. So we'll put some, some slow release fertilizer on top and that'll help feed them, but that's really temperature activated. Mm -hmm. So probably you're gonna need to uh, water them in from time to time with a liquid fertilizer so they get immediate fe feeding. Okay, now it's time to answer a few of your questions. And I have one today from Tony in Missouri. And Tony says, we're having a moderate drought and I have planted some new trees this fall and I'm concerned about them. Please help. Now, Tony, you're absolutely right. I mean, trees really do need to be watered in the winter, particularly if they don't have much moisture. You see, during winter, drought conditions can occur and dormant plants can still transpire moisture, although at a slower rate than when the temperatures are warm. Trees, shrubs, perennial and turf root systems may be damaged if not given supplemental irrigation during times of low rainfall. The plants that are most at risk are those that have been recently planted, evergreens, shallow-rooted species that may be in a microclimate where they receive reflected heat from buildings or walls or fences, and those that are on southern or western exposures or in a windy site where drying out of the soil can be accelerated. Even bulbs need plenty of water if you expect them to sprout in the spring. You want to monitor the weather conditions and the precipitation in your area, as well as the condition of your soil. If necessary, water deeply once every three to six weeks, depending on how fast your soil dries out. And if you can, water only when the air temperature is above 40 degrees and around the middle of the day, so it can soak in before the freezing night temperatures set in. Never water when the ground is frozen. You see, the purpose is to provide for the roots to prevent desiccation in cold, dry ground by keeping moist conditions. And one last thing, make sure that you disconnect and drain your water hoses after you use them. I hope this helps. Good luck, Tony. Okay, we need to take another short break, but when we return, I'll meet you in the kitchen to make this delicious pie. You don't want to miss it. I wish you could smell this pie. I just took it out of the oven. It's very hot, but it smells delicious. What it is, it's a pecan buttermilk pie. It combines two things I love, pecans and buttermilk. Now, pecans um, come into harvest uh, in, in November and December, and um, they're a great southern nut and used in lots of desserts and so forth. But why don't we get started with a lot of the ingredients that go into making sort of the base of the pie. First of all, what I'm going to do is take a stick of butter. This is salted butter, and I've melted it and it's one stick, and I'm pouring it in here like this. And then I'm gonna add the dry ingredients, everything except the eggs. Uh, we'll get to those in just a minute. I'm adding a cup and a half of sugar. There we go. And then the buttermilk, yum, yum. That's one cup of buttermilk. Now what we're gonna do is add the flour, and there's a fourth of a cup of, of flour, so I'm gonna just lower this, and I'm gonna add it slowly. I just don't want it to clump. It's blending very well. This recipe requires three eggs. So what I'm going to do is take these eggs, and these were laid by some of our heritage chickens, a great dual purpose breed, one called a New Hampshire Red. Beautiful markings on them. Red in color, as the name implies. They're a very good egg layer. So if you're thinking about having some chickens around, uh, a few New Hampshire red hens would be the way to go. It'll keep you in full supply of eggs. All right, now this is blending together nicely, so I'm gonna add these three eggs. And now for the last couple of ingredients, I'm going to take a teaspoon of vanilla and half a teaspoon of salt. And that's all it takes. All right, here we go. Now with this batter, I'm going to pour it into this pie shell like this. And I want to make sure we get all of that good stuff out of there. It's so yummy. And the last stage is to simply take the pecans. And what you take is a full cup. 
And what I have are glazed pecans here. And these are toasted, and they're toasted with some uh, corn syrup and sugar. And I'm just going to mash them up a little bit. These are pecan halves, and I want to break them up. So I just put them in a sandwich bag like this. Very easy to do. And then open up the bag and take those broken pecans and spread them out generously and evenly all over the top of the pie. Then you'll simply place the, the pie in the oven. It's preheated at 325 and the pie will need to bake for about, well, under an hour, 50 minutes. And I'm telling you, it is one of the best pies you will eat. I love to serve it with a little whipped cream and a great cup of coffee. Give it a try. I do love the aroma of fresh rosemary. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Anything in the show that you think you might have missed, you can always go on my website, pallensmith.com, and pick it up. And that includes that delicious recipe for pecan buttermilk pie. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream Of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing Of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh, no, I can't help but smile